This is Heki Ganroku case 51. Seppos, what is this? Engo's introduction. If you have the slightest choice of right and wrong, you will fall into confusion of mind. If you are not caught up in the ranks, there will be no groping in the dark. Tell me, which is advisable, letting go or holding fast? At this point, if you deal in terms of concepts and remain attached to sophisticated thinking, you are a ghost clinging to weeds and bushes. Even if you become innocent of such vulgarity, you are still thousands of miles from your homeland. Do you understand? If not, just study the present koan. See the following. Main subject. When Seppo was living in his hermitage, two monks came to pay their respects. As Seppo saw them coming, he pushed open the gate and presenting himself before them said, what is this? The monks also said, what is this? Seppo lowered his head and returned to his cottage. Later, the monks came to Ganto, who said, where are you from? The monks answered, we have come from south of the Nanre mountains. Ganto said, have you ever been to see Seppo? The monks said, yes, we have been to him. Ganto said, what did he say to you? The monks related the whole story. Ganto said, alas, I regret that I did not tell him the last word when I was with him. If I had done so, no one in the whole world could have pretended to outdo him. At the end of the summer session, the monks repeated the story and asked Ganto for his instruction. Ganto said, why didn't you ask earlier? The monks said, we have had a hard time struggling with this topic. Ganto said, Seppo came to life in the same way that I did but he does not die in the same way that I do. If you want to know the last word, I'll tell you simply this, this. Secho's verse. The last word, let me tell you. Light and darkness intermingled. Living in the same way you all know. Dying in different ways beyond telling. Absolutely beyond telling. Buddha and Dharma only nod to themselves. East, west, north and south. Homeward let us go, late at night, seeing the snow on the thousand peaks. So, how 
how does this relate to right understanding? When we talk about right understanding, unlike some other religions, Buddhism conceives of right understanding not in terms of doctrine, believing some sort of esoterica. Right understanding is a matter of recognizing reality for what it is. The Buddhist philosophers talk about three marks of existence or three characteristics of reality. Those characteristics, this is not philosophy or theorizing. These are simply observation of reality. The marks of existence are anika or impermanence, dukkha or unsatisfactoriness, and anatta or no self. And I'd like to talk a little bit about each of these, starting with impermanence. So impermanence, anika, is perhaps the most easily understood of all of the marks of existence. It's totally undeniable. We see impermanence every day, every moment of every day. Impermanence is what makes life possible. Impermanence is a seed dying so that a plant can sprout. A flower dying so that a fruit can form. The fruit dying so that the seeds of the fruit can find their place into the earth and start the cycle all over again. Impermanence is the glorious dawning of the new day. The fiery sky full of possibility. And it's also the warm embers of the setting sun falling behind the horizon. Impermanence is death. And every religion is founded on death and our relationship to death, our relationship to impermanence. When you realize impermanence, you realize that not only your body is going to die, but everybody that you love, everybody that you've ever cared about, and everybody that you hate, everybody who you consider an enemy 
is going to die. And everything that you supposedly own, which of course you don't really own at all, but only have the temporary use of, everything you own someday will fall into dust. That's impermanence. And religion, I don't care what religion you're talking about, Buddhism, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, whatever religion, Judaism, is really a way of learning to be comfortable, to relax and enjoy life, knowing all of that, knowing that you are going to die that everyone you love is going to die. That's impermanence. And how do you relax? How do you learn to accept and even cherish impermanence? And then the second mark of existence, dukkha. This is a little bit harder to really get the gist of. And people who don't understand Buddhism tend to think, oh, those Buddhists, they're so pessimistic. Everything is suffering, suffering this, suffering that. And in a certain sense, they're right. I don't think of it as pessimism. I think of it as realism. Dukkha is the recognition that every conditioned thing, every contingent thing, and that includes you, your thoughts, your emotions. All beings carry within themselves the seeds of suffering. Even in the midst of joy, there is the seed of suffering. Certainly in the midst of pain, hunger, oppression, cruelty, there is suffering. Buddha taught for 50 years and at the end of his life said, I have taught nothing but suffering, dukkha, and the cessation of dukkha and the path leading to the cessation of dukkha. So that was his expression of right understanding. The path leading to the cessation of dukkha. And then the last of the three characteristics, the three marks of existence anatta, or no self, no self. And this is undoubtedly the hardest of the three characteristics to really internalize, to really understand deep in your marrow Because after all, our daily existence is just one incident after another, one event after another, one thought after another, one emotion after another, 
one sensation after another, convincing us that there really is this separation between this thing called me, myself, I, and everything out there, you, society, the classes, the races, that somehow there is an independent being called me. And everything we do supports that notion. And yet the closer we look, the more we see how foolish that is. There is no me without the conditions and relationships that create me. The genetics, the family, the society, the country, the territory, the relationships of friends, of Sangha, the community. We are the sum of our relationships. And as our relationships change, this thing called me has to change. Recently, a good friend of mine died. And of course, the family, his family, was convulsed with grief. Especially his daughter, who is a really dear friend of mine. Simply convulsed with grief. And that grief is because something inside of her has died. It's not just her father that died. That whole part of her life, that part of her being has died and is no more. It's like having a part of you torn out And so grief, powerful, powerful grief, consumes her. When you feel that sort of grief, you know anatta you know that you, what you call yourself is not simply yourself, but the relationships that you have. The experience of anatta in Zen parlance is called shunyata, emptiness. Emptiness meaning devoid of self. And as we hear in the Heart Sutra, the Diamond Sutra, form is emptiness. All five skandhas are emptiness. This body is emptiness. This mind is emptiness. Right understanding is 
internalizing and fully appreciating reality for what it is, these marks of existence, impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, emptiness. And the reasons that we find ourselves in opposition to reality is what have been called the three poisons, which the term three poisons, of course, is the traditional Buddhist terminology. But it suggests that this is something taken in from outside. And that's not really the case. You can think of them as the three neuroses. It's a neurotic denial of reality. And the three poisons are grasping, which is our instinctive response to impermanence. Whatever is going to be lost, we want to hold on to. Greed, grasping, attachment. That's the neurosis that keeps us from being comfortable with impermanence. And then we have aversion, which is composed of anger, fear, ill will, hatred, aversion. And that is our instinctive response to suffering, to dukkha. It hurts. It's unpleasant. So what can I do to avoid it? Can I smash it to pieces? That's one way of avoiding it. Can I run away from it? Another way of avoiding it. Can I just live in fear of it? Keep it at arm's length as long as possible. It's all aversion. And that's our neurotic response to dukkha. And the last of the three poisons is delusion or ignorance. Delusion is what convinces us that despite all the evidence to the contrary, that we are simply the temporary expression of conditions and relationships, that we really are something special. We're the star of our own little universe. That we are, as it says in the Diamond Sutra, a separated ego individuality That's delusion. And that is what keeps us from experiencing shunyata, emptiness, no self. Of course, the irony is that simply dropping our opposition to reality and learning to not just accept it, but to be curious about it, to be in love with it, regardless of what is going on.
if we can be curious, if we can have the mind of a child who's just learning about reality and experience and doesn't have the response of aversion, of grasping, of delusion then really everything is just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And that is what we are practicing when we practice Sazen. Paying attention, not grasping, not avoiding, not turning away from, being curious. Being in love with experience. And so having given that background, let's go back to the koan. Most of the time when talking about one of the koans in the Hekigan Roku, I don't pay too much attention to the introduction. But in this case, the introduction is pretty to the point. The first line of the introduction in particular if you have the slightest choice of right and wrong, you will fall into confusion of mind. If you have the slightest choice of right and wrong, you will find, fall into Confusion of mind. Confusion is another possible translation of delusion or ignorance. Confusion of mind. At this point, if you deal in terms of concepts and remain attached to sophisticated thinking, you are a ghost clinging to weeds and bushes. So I've just given you a bunch of sophisticated concepts and words. Anika. Dukkha, anatta. But really, they're not sophisticated at all. They're just a recognition of what is. And you can twist yourself up in knots thinking about what they mean. or you can just proceed straight ahead, looking into your own heart and mind because the answer is there. There's nothing that you have to do to find the answer except look deeply into your own heart and mind. We're going on to the main subject. When Seppo was living in his hermitage, two monks came to pay their respects. That sentence has a lot of subtext to it. First of all, why was Seppo living in a hermitage? 
probably he was living in a hermitage because this was one of those periods of disarray in China when Buddhism was being persecuted, when religions in general were being persecuted, but particularly the Buddhist religion, which was the most powerful and richest of the religions in China at that time. Seppo's great friend, Dharma friend, Ganto, also was killed during such a period when Buddhists were not under the protection of the emperor and bandits and warlords roamed the countryside and looking for treasure in the monastery assaulted Ganto and killed him. Of course, that happened well after this particular story. And then the other subtext here is two monks who are traveling together, going on pilgrimage together, visiting Zen masters, visiting Zen temples, two monks. And here we have an example of the importance of Dharma friendships. Seppo and Ganto were two such friends, close, almost inseparable. Ganto, younger in age than Seppo, but already having had his great enlightenment, traveling with Seppo. When they were snowed in and couldn't move for a week, and Seppo, the serious Zen student, sitting up all hours of the night in his room that he shared with Ganto, reading and sitting and sitting and reading, studying the sutras, studying the words of the masters. And Ganto nearby sleeping contentedly taking it easy, taking it easy because he had learned in the words of Rinzai that there really was nothing left to do. Looking into your own heart and mind was all that mattered. And Seppo, scolded Ganto for being such a lax Zen student. Scolded him because Seppo's heart was unsettled. Seppo had learned the truth of impermanence and the truth of dukkha, but had not learned the truth of anatta, shunyata, had not had these marks of existence penetrate to the very marrow.
And Ganto said to him, and I paraphrase, the real treasure does not enter through the front door. The Dharma treasure cannot enter through the front door. Only look into your own heart and mind. And Seppo, who had practiced diligently for so long, at these words had an awakening. So Dharma friendship is so important. When I was training at the monastery, my great friend was Denko Osho, who was eventually made one of the Dharma heirs of Edo Roshi. And the two of us were inseparable. I can hardly imagine my own path towards Dharma understanding without thinking of Denko Osho. We are the sum of our relationships, including very deeply our Dharma relationships, our relationship to our teacher, our relationship to the Sangha, our relationship to family, to friends. That is anatta. We are not just I, me, mine. We are limitless, unbounded. Relationships proximate and relationships far, far, far distant relationships in the past, present, and future. That's no self. As Seppo saw them coming, he pushed open the gate and presenting himself before them said, what is this? This is the sort of thing that I I, I would have loved to have been there. I would have loved to have seen how he said this, what tone of voice, what expression. What is this? Did he say it with the imperious demanding, what is this? Or did he say in a gentle, imploring fashion. What is this? Regardless of how he said it, the question is the fundamental question of Zen. What is this? This moment right now, this moment of impermanence, this moment of dukkha, this moment of shunyata, this moment of nirvana, this moment of samsara, 
this limitless moment. What is this? This is always the question we're asking when we do Zazen, no matter how we're phrasing the question. Even when we don't ask the question, that's the question. Even when we are simply directing our attention to the breath, there is the unspoken question, what is this? This breath, this sound, this body, this mind, this feeling, this moment. What is this? What is this? What is this? When we're sleepy, what is this? When we're sick and tired of ourselves and our, our bullshit, what is this? When we're overjoyed, and full of ourselves, what is this? And the two monks answered him, what is this? And the answer perhaps didn't satisfy Seppo who simply turned around and went back into his hut and ignored these two monks who had traveled so far and endured so many hardships to come to see him. And this is also indicative of the Zen method. The Zen method does not explain the way I explained the three marks of existence. It doesn't spoon feed It doesn't pat your hand. It directs you back upon yourself over and over again, just as Ganto directed Seppo back into himself. Look into your own heart and mind. The Dharma treasure does not enter through the front door, the door of the ears, the door of the eyes, which is not to say that study is useless. or to hear Dharma talks is useless, or to study koans is useless. Of course there are uses for such things, but it all comes back to looking into your own heart and mind to the degree that a sutra may turn your attention back into your own heart and mind, or a koan can turn your attention back into your own heart and mind. Or sitting in zazen and following your breath and observing everything that arises, all of it, the things that we are happy about, the things that we're ashamed about, the wild goose chases 
and flights of fancy that we go on. Looking into these things, but without attaching to them, without grasping, and also without aversion. Not turning away because it's painful. Not getting angry because there's some part of ourselves that we don't want to recognize. Observing. so that our delusion of separation can melt on its own accord. You could say that Seppo treated these people roughly by doing nothing more than asking a single question and when the answer came back and didn't satisfy him, turning around and going back into his hut. But honestly, Seppo had given them the greatest Dharma talk of all time. Much more to the point than all of the blah, blah, blah that I've been spouting. What is this? That's all that he had to say. And so that's all he said. Later, the monks came to Ganto, who said, where are you from? And they told him that they had come from down Seppo's way and told him all about everything that had happened between him, the two of them, and Seppo. And Ganto, who was a great trickster, a great devilish sense of humor, said, alas, I regret that I did not tell him the last word when I was with him. If I had done so, no one in the whole world could have pretended to outdo him. So that is all Ganto has to say on the subject at this time. And the two monks who really are very serious Zen students, very dedicated, very honest, very sincere, sit with this for the entire summer session. One supposes that they never go to Dokusan, perhaps Perhaps they're too ashamed to go to Dokusan. At any rate, they sit with it and ponder it. What did Seppo mean? What did Ganto mean? How did we pretend to outdo him? What is going on? And this is the sort of encounter, dharma encounter, that Zen masters use to provoke students into right understanding, into understanding that goes beyond words and phrases to a real marrow level appreciation of the marks of existence, of reality. Not a theoretical understanding, 
but understanding deep in your bones. That understanding is called great faith. Great faith is based on right understanding. And right understanding, great faith is based, is the fruit of great doubt. Looking over and over and over into this moment, this moment of Dukkha, this moment of pain, this moment of impermanence, this moment of shunyata, looking at it over and over and over again, and learning to recognize the three neuroses the poisons of grasping and aversion and delusion. And watching them come and go and come and go. And learning to be relaxed with it. Learning that this is just the way it is. Just the way it is. So at the end of the summer session, the monks come back to Ganto. And repeated the story and asked for instruction. Ganto said, why didn't you ask earlier? The monks said, we've had a hard time struggling with this topic. And this struggling is great doubt that gives rise to great faith. Ganto said, Seppo came to life in the same way that I did, but he does not die in the same way that I do. If you want to know the last word, I'll tell you simply this 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 seppo posed the question the question of great doubt, the question of what is this? What is reality? And Ganto expressed great faith, this, this, exactly this, nothing but this. And that is the Zen version of right understanding. <laughs> 